Greetings, friend. I will show you how Simon Anthony of Kraken Cryptic solved this fiendish times puzzle. And I'll explain all my Sudoku tips, tricks, and strategies to you as I do it. I'll also include some pause the video and what if moments to help you analyze some altered solve paths. Click the link below if you want to try this puzzle yourself. And with that, it's solving time. Okay. First thing Simon marked were some threes down here in block seven. There's only two spots for a three there. And he also marked some threes up here in block one, uh, rows two and three, column two. And then he solves for a six over here in row eight, column eight. And the reason he solves for this six, and you can see there's a six here and a six here, so the six has to be in row eight. There's a six here, but then if you look up here, the six creates a pointing, this is a pointing paraf, you're pointing triple block cannon. So six has to be in block three in column nine, so the sixes can't be there, so that means you can solve this for a six. Now, Simon first did this puzzle, I believe it was from the 31st of January, 2018. This is an older video form, so it's very interesting to see some of the techniques Simon used in some of these early videos. Okay, after solving for that six, uh, he then looked for sevens, and he saw there's a one place for a seven here in block five. So that seven, uh, then he marks some sevens in block eight. You can see there's a seven here and seven here. Come down. In case you're wondering, uh, this marking is called Snyder notation. So if there's only two possibilities for a cannon in a three by three block, you make those marks in case you solve one of those cells, you immediately solve the other for that candidate. Uh, most of the viewers at this time were still pretty new to Kraken and Cryptic. And when they saw Snyder notation, they were pretty amazed. They said, this is a great way to solve. When, and I... I will admit, the first time I saw Snyder was watching a crafted, Cracking the Cryptic video myself. So after doing those sevens, he uh, came over and said, okay, we got a three and a three coming down, and this three coming across with seven, so we can solve for three here. And now you see the Snyder notation in play, so they will solve for three right there in row eight, column one. Uh, then finally notice that there's a seven coming down here. I'm going to solve the seven right away. The seven comes down. Column one, and so there's only one place left for a seven there in row seven, uh, column three there in block seven. Uh, then he looks up here and says, okay, I got three seven here in column one, three seven here in column three, and a three seven coming across row one. So that means we have a three seven pair. Uh, it's a hidden pair, but those two candidates can only be in those two spots. So it's always handy to put in some of those hidden candidates there. And after that, uh, he fills out the rest of block seven because this is a one eight naked pair because there's only two cans left in block seven. So after marking this one eight, Simon looks up and notices uh, there's only two spots for one up here in block one. So he makes those marks. After marking the ones, um, he shifts his focus over here to the four and see, okay, remember there's this four and a six are both. A point pair because the four and six can't be in this spot. And so with the four coming down column seven and then column nine, there's only one place left for a four here and block nine. So we mark that four in row seven, column eight. Then you mark some fours in block eight because now there are only two spots available here in block eight. After marking those fours, um, notice is a one eight naked pair because you're looking at column eight, there's only two candidates remaining. So we mark those one eight naked pair. Uh, then shifts his focus to the fives. This is okay. I see a five here and a five cutting across. So now we have fives as a pointing pair. Pointing pair means that they point down. The fives can no longer be here in block nine. Uh, they in column nine because they're limited to column nine up here in block six. So then the fives got to be somewhere on this side. You see there's already a five coming down in row eight, or excuse me, row nine. So we make that mark for the fives in block nine, row seven and eight, column seven. Uh, then looks up and sees, oh, I can solve for a, a three. So there's a three coming across rows five and four and coming up column four. So we solve that for three, row six, column six. Uh, notice is now with this eight cutting across, there's only two spots for an eight in block five. So it's still a good snare notation, even if they're not you know, lined up in a row or column, you still want to make that mark there. Uh, it continues on with the threes. Every time you mark something, you solve a cell, look and see what it does for you. So a three and a three up. Columns four and six, you see a three come across row one. So now you can solve for a three, row three, column five, and that immediately affects this hidden pair. So we solve for a three in row two, column two, and then the seven 
in row three, column two. Now, how does that affect our sevens? Up here, you got a seven in row one, row three. So only one place left for a seven over there in block three. So he marks that. Uh, then he marks the sevens down in block nine. So same idea. The sevens come down here. Sevens are limited to column seven down here in block nine, which is seven come across row seven. So he makes that mark. And then Simon finds a really cool naked single. So this brings us up to our first pause the video moment. Pause the video and see if you can find a naked single along column seven while I give you a few seconds. Okay, congratulations if you spot it. You're very good at finding these naked singles, especially considering the rows, columns, and blocks that they feed into it. And those of you who just want to enjoy the show, right here, row three, column seven is a naked single eight. Because see there's a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, and a nine. So that has to be an eight. Simon found that and was able to move on um, with the puzzle from there. After marking that eight, Simon then marked two eights down here in block nine. You see there's a lot of activity going on down here in block nine because you have this four, six, three covering up the middle. And you see there's an eight coming across row eight, so two spots for an eight there. And now uh, Simon actually marks and finishes up block three first, four and six. But then he focuses back down here and he notices that the eights are limited to these two cells along with the ones, these two cells in block seven. And then I'm going to show this here. The ones are limited to these three cells in block nine. And so one eight here, one eight here. And so Simon starts to go, and, okay, can the one be here or here? And the answer he comes up with is no. And the reason being is that uh, uniqueness. And so I have a tutorial for a unique rectangle. I'll put a Link right here, you can go check it out. But the idea of a unique rectangle is that you know this puzzle has a unique solution. And Simon even says it's the times, they should have vetted it correctly, it should have a unique solution. If you put a 1 here or here, then you notice this would be an 8, that would be a 1, that would be an 8. But you finish the rest of the grid, and then you could put an 8 here, 1, 8, 1, you would have two solutions to the puzzle. Because as a unique solution, we know that a 1 can't be there and it can't be there. Eights have to be in one of those spots, but the 1s aren't limited there. So Simon is able to solve for a 1 right here using uniqueness. And what's interesting about this is Simon really gets away from unique. He doesn't really do this anymore. In fact, he probably got some criticism about it. Uh, he found most setters don't set puzzles, handmade Sudokus, uh, that need uniqueness to solve, so usually we'll look for a workaround path. Um, so I found it interesting that he did use uniqueness to solve this puzzle and, and get to this point. Uh, I solved this puzzle myself. I did not use uniqueness in there. In fact, I found some other strategies. So that's going to bring us up to our first what-if moment. What if Simon didn't find this one and use uniqueness? Is there another way to move forward in this puzzle? And I'll show you that right now. Okay, so if you did not find the uniqueness right there, uh, Another way to proceed with this puzzle, let's look across row 8, because the focus point really is row 8. Where can a 7 be in row 8? You'll notice 7 can't be uh, here in column 4 because of this 7. It can't be in column 6 because of this 7. And it can't be in column 9 because of that 7. So a 7 is limited to that spot right there. So you could solve for that for a 7. Now when you solve that for a 7 and this place is a 5, you could solve for that 5. You'll notice now 5 and a 5, this creates a 4-5 uh, hidden pair. And now look, you have the 4-5 there. You have every other cell filled out. So guess what you could solve for right here? A 1. So that's another way around the uniqueness and still being able to solve this cell for a 1 and making progress in this puzzle. So now let's go back to the main solve. Okay, after marking the 1 in row 8, column 9, Simon puts a 1, 7 there in block 8. Row 7, 9, column 5, because he notices that there are two spots there for the 1 and the 7. 
But he could have actually solved for this one right away. He just kind of missed that. Uh, he does a 2 9 here in block 6. So row 7 and 9, column 6 is going to be a 2 9. You see this 2 9 cutting across. And it can't be in these two spots. And then he does a 4 5 here in block 8, row 8, column 4 and 6. After that, he says, okay, I got the 5 here, I got the 5 here, I can actually solve for the 5 up there in block 7, uh, excuse me, row 7, column 7, and he also can solve for the 7 and row 8, column 7, so he kind of got back and got that 7 in there that we were talking about before. So from right here, what Simon does is he goes, okay, I'm looking at column 7 here, so this, the only two cells ran are 2 nine. so there's 2 nine here, 2 nine here, he doesn't actually mark this 2 nine. but he goes, okay, that's a 2 nine. that's a 2 nine. So what's remaining is a 1, 7, 8. And since there's a 1 and a 7 right here, you can solve this cell for an 8. So he just marks that for an 8 in row 9, column 9. Then he cuts across and cleans up the bottom here. It's an 8 in row 7, column 1. The 1 in row 9, column 1. Uh, the 1 in row 7, column 5. And then the 7 in row 9, column 5. Notice there's just two spells remaining in block 9. So he marks that 2, 9 naked pair. Uh, then sh shifts his focus and starts looking at the sixes. He goes, okay, I got a six here in column four and five. Only one place left for a six up here in block two. So marks that for a six. And then only two spots left for a five. Marks those fives, which just creates a pointing pair. So now the fives are pointing down. They're limited to block two up here in column four. So that means this can no longer be a 5. So he's able to solve that for a 4, solve that for a 5. After solving the 5 in row 8, column 6, he looks up and knows the only place left for a 4 in block 2. So he solved that 4 in row 1, column 5. Uh, then solves for a 6 in row 1, column 9, because he had the 4 and the 6 there. Solves that for a 4. Cuts across and knows, okay, 6, 6, 6 coming up here. Only one spot left for a 6 in row 3. He solves that 6, row 3, column 1. Then shifts his attention to the 8. And he sees, okay, we've looked down here. There's only two cells remaining. And one of them is an 8. And this 8 cutting through. So he's able to solve for an 8, row 4, column 6. Uh, after solving that, he goes, okay, the last cell remaining in that is a 4. And so this is common. You're, you're kind of doing a full house right now. You know, one cell remaining, go always focus on that. I made a video about all single cell solving methods where you know how to focus on and solve in what order to solve these cells the full house whenever you see one you want to do that so I'll put a link to that right here you can go check that out and it'll help out with solving uh, the latter half of puzzles like this one after solving the four he looks again over here about the eights and solves an eight there and solves for the one there in column 8 and then comes back and solves for a 9 to finish off the full house in column 5. After the 9, he marks 9s in block 6. Only two spots left there. Uh, then he marks a 1 and 2 because there's two cells remaining. So he marks the 1s and 2 right there in block 5. Uh, comes up and says, okay, I got the 1, 2 there. This is now a naked triple of 5, 8, 9. So he makes the marks for that, uh, 8, 9, 5, 8, and a 5, 9. Uh, then looks over and sees, okay, I got a 4 and a 4, and I got a 4 coming up. I can actually solve for a 4 up there in block 1. So row 2, column 1, solves for a 4. Then solves for a 4 in row 4, column 2. Because you can see the 4 coming down column 1, and these two 4s here. And then, this is pretty interesting, what Simon sees is just, what can these cells be? So this can be a 1, 2, that can be a 1, 2. So this can be a 1, 2. He doesn't mark it, but he goes, that's a 1, 2, and that's a 1, 2. So what's remaining in row 6 is a 5, 9, and a 5, 9. So I'll mark the 1, 2. So now hopefully you can see 5, 9, 5, 9. And so this is a 5, 9. He comes up here and goes, oh, look in row 3. 5, 9, this also has to be a 5, 9, because there's only two cells remaining in row three. 
So if those are both fives and nines, the nines can't be anywhere else, and the fives can't be anywhere else in column three. So he looks right here and goes, well, this is a five eight. Can't be a five because these two have to be fives. And so he solves that for an eight. So I'll mark that for an eight, and I just wanted to show you the logic there, even though Simon didn't mark it in his original solve. After placing that eight in row two, column three, he uh, was able to mark the one right away because there's only one spot uh, left for one because he realized that was not going to be a five nine, right? Five nine, five nine, that has to be a one. After the one, he marks an eight up here in row one, column four, because he sees, all right, I got a five, eight, nine, so the eight can't be here anymore, so that's eight, that's five, that's nine. He marks the naked triple and solves them. Moving off after the naked triple, he then focuses over and marks a two up there in row four, column one, and then gets the five in row three, column three. And then the nine, he finishes off this five nine here because you see, in you know, I finished off all these rows. Uh, and so with this nine and that nine, there's one spot left for a nine right there in block six. And so there's a two nine, so he solves for the two right there in row four, column one. Uh, then solves the nine up there in row one, column one. Comes back down, goes, okay, I got a one, I got a one. I can solve for this one here. In row six, column two, and then the one in row five, column four, the two in row six, column four, uh, the five to finish off column, block four, and then five in row, you know, it comes here, it's nine rotation, row six, column nine, gets that other five. Notice it's okay, I got the nine up here, so there's only one spot left for a nine in block nine, so he solves the nine, solves the two, solves the other two here in row seven, column six, finishes off the nine down there, and then gets the last digit, which is a two in row five, column nine. If you want to get more familiar with expert Sudoku tips, tricks, and strategies, check out this other analysis video I did of one of Simon Anthony's puzzles, along with this other puzzle I think you'll enjoy. If you want to further support Smart Hobbies by buying me a coffee, click on the link in the description below. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching.